Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the world of ListView. My name is Romain Guy, and I'm an Android engineer at Google. I work on the UI toolkit and a few other things. And uh, joining me today is Adam Powell. He's also an engineer at Google. He works also on the UI toolkit. And uh, if you've ever been mad at ListView, it's probably my fault and now his fault. Uh, so if you have uh, things to tell us at the end of the session, come talk to us, and uh, you can uh, you know, do whatever you want to us. Um, before we get started, uh, we have a Google Wave where you can uh, share notes during the presentation. You can also ask questions. You can vote on the questions asked by other people. You can also uh, downvote the questions that you think are stupid. Uh, and here's the URL uh, once you will be able to see it. Uh, so try to write it down. If you don't have the time to write it down right now, we'll put the slide up at the end of the, the session. And you can also go to the Google I.O. website and there's a link to, uh, to that wave. Uh, and we'll also take qu live questions, of course. So how many of you have ever used ListView as a developer in an Android application? Raise your hand. That's uh, scary and good. Uh, how many of you have found ListView to be difficult to use? The other ones are lying. And how many of you have uh, swore at ListView in the past few days? Yeah, I see some team in hands. That's good, that's good. That means you're doing some complex stuff with it. Uh, for those of you who've never used ListView, I mean, it's a pretty common widget on Android. It's used in, I, I think, almost every application we ship. Uh, and you can see an example here on the slide on the, on the left side. That's one of our API demos. So it just stacks uh, widgets vertically. Most of the time, ListView shows simple text. Sometimes you have icon and text, but you can do very, very complex ListViews. Uh, before we ship Android 1.0, actually, we had a version of Gmail where when you opened an email, we were using a ListView made of web views uh, to display a conversation. We stopped doing that because it works, uh, but it's not that great to use. Uh, but if you really want to do something really crazy, you can. Uh, and of course, you can also do some very complex things with ListView. So uh, on the right side, you see an example of an app I wrote uh, that customizes a ListView. It's actually a grid view, which is very similar. Uh, and you can customize the background. You can customize the selection. You can have uh, very complex items inside, the, in, inside each row. Um, and just for the, for, the, for the side note, like everything we're gonna talk about today applies to ListView, but also applies to GridView. There's a couple of things that are specific to ListView, uh, but pretty much everything applies to GridView as well. So if you ever need a GridView, you can refer to this talk, you can refer to the slides, and uh, everything will be the same. So here's our agenda for this session. We're gonna talk about adapters and virtualization and how basically uh, uh, ListView works inside. Uh, then we're going to see how you can customize items. So this is the items properties. Then headers and footers, we're going to talk about selectors. And then we're going to finish the talk with a few other features and what you should never, ever, ever do with a list view. Uh, and I will ask during the last slides, like, you know, who amongst the audience is doing the things that you should never do, and I'll be really mad at you. So Adam is going to uh, start by, with adapters. Okay. So the problem present here is dealing with large data sets, specifically presenting those large data sets. If you have 10,000 items available to you, how do you get that on screen so that the user can peruse them, so that you can get through them relatively quickly? The two big challenges for dealing with that is memory and performance. You don't want to attach 10,000 views into your view hierarchy. Views are fairly heavyweight objects in that sense. And you want to be able to fling through them quickly. People really sort of expect to be able to navigate things quickly on touchscreen devices especially. So the solution that we've implemented in ListView is that we populate views on demand. So we only bring up new views as they're actually needed. Nothing actually gets added to the view hierarchy that isn't going to be displayed on screen. Secondly, we recycle those views. So we reuse the views that we've already created and just fill in new content as they come through. This helps us address a lot of the performance issues that come up when you're cycling through things very quickly, when you're flinging through a very long list. So a little bit of terminology to start off with, just because there's a lot of different ways to refer to data when you're working with a list view. When we talk about an index, we're talking about child views within the view group in the hierarchy. So if you're calling get child at to go ahead and fetch a view that's there, that's when we're talking about indices. When we're talking about position, we're talking about a position of an element within your adapter. And finally, when we talk about IDs, each item within an adapter can have a unique identifier that refers to the value of the data stored there. So if things start shuffling around, you perform insertions or deletions on the data that's, backed, or that's backing your adapter, 
then this lets us do a few extra tricks when you have stable IDs. When you tell the list view that you have stable IDs by returning true from your adapters has stable IDs function, then we're able to perform a few extra tricks that just makes the, pr the presentation a little bit nicer when a lot of elements get added or removed. We can try and keep the data relatively stable on screen. And uh, understanding what the index position and ID do is very important because I gotta admit, the documentation of ListView is uh, somewhat lacking, to remain polite, and that's entirely our fault, we're very sorry. Uh, but we've been very careful uh, with respect to the naming of, of our parameters. So whenever you see a method that talks about position or you see a parameter of a method that, that, that's, that's called index, you know it's guaranteed that it's gonna be those meanings. Uh, everything is, 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 is pretty, uh, pretty good on, uh, in that regard. Definitely. So, the meat of your adapter is going to be the getView method. This is what takes your data from your data source, whatever that may be, whether it be something that you're fetching from a network, something from a database that's local, doesn't matter what it is. GetView gives you full presentation control over your data. You can return any arbitrary view, and then that becomes your element within the list view. So within GetView, we offer a lot of opportunities to optimize this entire process. And kind of to go along with that, because we make assumptions in order to make these optimizations, there's a lot of opportunity to shoot yourself in the foot. And I'm sure that some of you have come across one or more of these before. You know, why can't I click on this element that's a child far down in this particular list item? We'll get into some of that. We'll get into why. And specifically, we'll get into the fairly narrow subset of things that you should be doing within GetView. Is this? Oh, he's still. So, list view tries to be smart. Um, as you can see, it's fairly easy to outsmart here and there. But through get view, we pass in an extra view parameter called convert view. We talked about how list view ends up reusing some of these views as you're flinging through data quickly. Convert view is how it makes that happen. List view will keep track of all the extra views that are moving off screen and then give you one back to fill out with your existing data. This is the convert view parameter that we saw on this slide here. So this will automatically match up item types for you as well. If you have multiple different types of data within your adapter, then convert view will always be the correct type as long as you tell list view what type each position in your adapter is. We'll get to that in a little bit as well. So if a convert view parameter passed to your get view is not null, please reuse it. It's going to help the performance of your application quite a bit. So there are different ways to implement the getView method. Uh, we're gonna see three of those different methods. There's the slow way, the correct way, and the fast way. Uh, so first of all, look at this slide really quickly, and uh, please raise your hand, and that's okay, don't be ashamed, if you've ever written a getView method like this. Roman, I'm sure some of you have done it. Okay, at least there's someone honest in the room. Yeah, Thanks. There's a few more over here, too. <laughs> Uh, so this is the, the naive way you would implement getView. You would just uh, create a new view every time getView is, in, is invoked. So you can see here at line number two, we're inflating a view from XML. This is a very expensive operation. We have to parse the XML, and even though this is highly optimized on Android, it still takes quite a bit of time. We have to initialize the view, we have to allocate the memory, you know, and it can be, it can be very costly when the view is made of, of subviews. So here, for instance, uh, the view we're inflating in that example is a linear layout that contains an image view and a text view. Once we've created it, uh, in line three and four, we just uh, bind some data to those two views. So we, we put some text in the text view, an image on the image view, and then we return the view that we've created. Now the big problem with that is if the user is flinging the list and is trying to, to th scroll through thousands of items, then we're gonna create thousands of those views, which is gonna, going to take a lot of memory. Uh, to give you an idea, um, a view on Android costs about one or two kilobytes of, of RAM. Um, so you know, if you have a thousand views, that's already a meg of RAM that you're, that you're, you're wasting, uh, which means that the garbage collector is gonna kick in and it's gonna uh, stop your UI thread, it's gonna make the animation stutter, and the user will be really pissed at your application. And don't believe that uh, lists of thousands of items are rare, because for instance, I know many people who have thousands of contacts in their, application, in, in, in their address book. And it's very easy to do when uh, your email application is set up to create contacts automatically whenever you, you reply to an email. 
Uh, so to fix this, it's uh, like we mentioned, you just have to reuse the convert view. Uh, so simply check whether or, view the, whether or not the convert view is null. If it's null, then you have to create a new view. You can inflate from XML, you can create the view programmatically, you do whatever you want, but you have to create a new view. Uh, in the other case, if the convert view is, is, is already available, just reuse it. Uh, we, we, like we said, we guarantee that the convert view is the type of view that you want. So you know that you're gonna have your text view, you know that you're gonna have your image view, and this is, this is going to be much faster. Basically, with this method, uh, you're going to allocate only the number of views you need to fill the screen. Sometimes it's gonna allocate like one or two more, but most of the time it's gonna be only like seven or eight views on the Nexus one, for instance. So it's very, very little. Now, there's a, another technique to, uh, uh, to make that implementation go faster. It's a, a pattern that we call the view holder that we developed on the Android team just before 1.0 because we were running into performance issues, especially with, with address books full of uh, thousands of contacts. So the idea is that you're gonna create a small data structure in your application that is going to hold data that's, uh, that, that's static for each given uh, row of the list. So in that example, for each item in the, in the list, we are doing a find view by ID uh, to find a text view and an image view in lines five and six. So why should we bother doing it you know, thousands, thousands of times as we scroll through a big list? So instead, we're just gonna hold the things uh, once and forever in this little class called the view holder. So you can create it wherever you want. Uh, try to make that class static uh, so you, you don't leak uh, the enclosing instance. Uh, and this is how, what the code looks like when you use the view holder. So the only difference is that when you create a new view, when the convert view is null, you create your instance of the view holder, you do the work of finding the, the, the children of the view. So here we find the text view and the, and the image view, so that's line five to nine. Uh, and then you can set the, the, the holder as the tag for the view. So the tag is just a random object. It can be anything you want that you can put on a view. Um, and we, we, we use the tag facility here to store extra data. Um, when you have a convert view that's passed to you uh, by list view, you simply get the tag, uh, you cast it to, uh, as a view holder, and then if you look at line 16 and 17, you can see that we access the text view and the image view directly. So we, we save the cost of doing the find view by ID. And this is a very simple example, uh, but in some applications, uh, you can store even more data in there. You can store, for instance, char arrays to do uh, uh, database queries to avoid allocating new, new arrays of characters every time you do a query. Um, and this is a, a, a comparison of, in perf of the performance of the three methods. So we, we, we took those numbers using uh, the Froyo build of Android that you guys don't have yet. Uh, so this is running uh, with a, a fast CPU because we're on the Nexus one. And we created a, li we created a list of 10,000 items. Each item is a linear layout that contains an image and a text view. Uh, with the dumb way, so with the dumb implementation of get view, we get about 20 frames per second. When we implement get view correctly by reusing the convert view, we go up to 50 frames per second. And finally, when we use the view holder, we go up to 55 frames per second. Uh, to give you an idea on the Nexus one, the maximum number of frames per second you can get is 60. So when you take into account the overhead of just redrawing the view hierarchy, issuing all the commands, binding the views, uh, reading the bitmap, stuff like that, uh, this is pretty much as fast as you can go uh, inside an adapter. So if you can reach those numbers inside your application, you're good to go. If you're on the left side, then keep working. Okay. So as I mentioned before, there are a lot of ways to shoot yourself in the foot during this process. Most of it has to do with trying to outsmart the way that GetView tries to optimize things for you. So don't create any sort of local view cache. Don't try and be smart and say, okay, well, I know that position one is always going to be this element, so I'm just gonna save this view away in my adapter and always return this whenever I'm asked for position one. The problem with that is that due to the implementation of the recycler inside list view, if you're not passing back either a new view that was just created or exactly the convert view instance that was passed to you, it's going to assume that anything else that was ever attached to the list view is dead, and it's just gonna go ahead and throw it away. Now, sometimes this can end up getting reattached in really strange ways, and it won't always look like there's a problem at first until you start observing some very strange behavior. So don't cache views locally like that, and don't access the views from the adapter that way. Don't change convert view structure either. Just because you have a view coming in, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be adding and removing extra content from that view. That's what the type system is for. 
we can actually have convert view pass you back exactly the type of view that you need that already has all these other subviews initialized for you. So just because you have different types of data within your adapter doesn't necessarily mean that you need to try to perform all sorts of manipulations on convert view when it comes in. And lastly, don't make assumptions about get view calls. We've seen developers try to do things like, okay, get view was just called for position five. So I'm going to store something about this particular view instance is position five, and I'm going to cache that someplace. I'm going to just so that I can refer back to that view quickly whenever data behind it updates. The problem with this is that the order of get view calls isn't guaranteed. So we may end up calling get view behind the scenes to go ahead and measure out how big the list view can be. And we might do this with a throwaway convert view that we're passing to you, again, for performance reasons. So the view that you get, the, the last view that you get passed to you for a position may not actually be the one that ends up on screen later on. And actually, a great example of uh, making assumptions about the ordering of the get view calls is something that happened to us inside, uh, inside the Android team really recently. Uh, the Gmail application was making one of these assumptions. And suddenly in Froyo, uh, they changed something about their UI that make them, made them go through a different code path in this view. And suddenly, the order of the get view calls changed. And every, every single one of your emails in your inbox looked like the first email of the inbox. And that wasn't a bug in Lizu, that was a prime in the application because they were assuming that they would, uh, they would get, get you zero, get you one, get you two, get you three, which wasn't the case anymore. And to give you an idea, I think we have at least four or five different ways to perform layout in Lizu. So sometimes we're gonna start by doing the layout from the bottom of the screen, sometimes we start from the top, some, sometimes we start from the middle. Uh, so again, don't make any assumption about the order of the calls. Okay. So what happens when your data changes? Whenever your data changes, you need to update your adapter in some way. And not only that, but you need to tell list view that the adapter was updated. You do this by calling notify data set changed. This basically triggers list view to, to rescan your adapter for the views that are on screen, repopulate them, deal with any sort of manipulations in terms of scrolling the list if there's fewer data elements in there now, or growing it out if there's more. If your data set becomes unavailable, for example, if like your backing file gets deleted, if your network access goes out, Notify data set invalidated will tell us that there is no more data. It's entirely gone. And we're not going to try and access it anymore. And uh, we'll talk about it more later, but it's very, very important to call notify data set changed. Most of the bugs I see filed against Lizu usually come from the application not calling notify data set changed correctly. Uh, it has to be called on the UI thread, and it has to be called every time you modify your adapter, especially when you change the number of items inside the, 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 the adapter. And actually, uh, I don't remember for what release, it was maybe Donut or, or Eclair, so 1.6 or 2.0. Uh, we added a new exception in Lizview, so it tries to detect the case when you change the adapter without telling the Lizview, and when that happens now, we crash. We throw an exception, and we have a very, very long and detailed message uh, in the uh, logcat telling you that you're doing something wrong, probably with a thread. Uh, so if you see that message, pay attention to it. It's very important that you fix this issue. So we mentioned before that ListView will handle different view types for you. A lot of times you have more than one type of data that you want to display at once. Certain list elements you may want to include images in, certain ones may have extended quoted text. All of these things end up being different types of data that you want to display within the same list. And ListView will help you out with this. The function getItemViewType on your adapter tells ListView what type the view at that position should be. So generally, this is, this is just an integer parameter that you pass back. So however many types you have, return that from get view type count. And list view will maintain basically a recycler for each one of these different view types that you have. And it'll always be ready to hand you back the correct one when get view gets called. Uh, and something also very important about the, the item types is that the number of types you have, so when you implement the get view type count method, that number has to be constant throughout the duration, th throughout the life cycle of your adapter. You cannot make that number change. It's okay if you said that you have 10 types and you actually end up using only two. 
um, it, it's not gonna be, a, uh, it's not gonna waste any resources. But if you change that number, then very, very bad things will happen in Lisu, and you will see like really weird behavior that might, uh, that might uh, be very solved from time to time. Um, so try to figure out what, what is the maximum number of types you're gonna need and return that, that, that number from the get, that get you type count method. So what happens when you have a data source that's really slow? You're bringing something in over a network, you're reading a large file. One way or another, you're not going to be able to keep up with it on your UI thread and still remain responsive. So fetching that data can actually happen anywhere. You can spin off another thread, send a request out to the network. It doesn't matter. But the important thing to remember is that you always commit your adapter changes on the UI thread. And once again, make sure you call notify data set changed. So any changes have to be reflected on that UI thread. And you also have to call notify data set change in the same UI event where you commit the changes to the adapter. You can't change the adapter, then sometimes later send a notify data set change to the list view. Because in between, there might be a request for a layout, and then list view will have conflicting data. Then we're, gonna, we're going to talk about a couple of uh, item properties. So the first one is actually really simple. It's uh, the ability to disable list items. Uh, if you look at the, uh, at the adapter interface, so when you create your own adapter, there's a method that lets you uh, tell list you whether or not an item is enabled. Uh, by default, all items are enabled. Uh, and having an enabled item lets you select it with the trackball, so you get, you get with the default theme uh, the orange highlight behind the item. It lets you also click the item and you can get a non-list item click event. Um, in some cases though, you want to disable those items, and disabling items is not necessarily to show the user that this item is not available. For instance, it may be a web server that, that, that's not reachable. Uh, it's also for simply to create uh, different items, items that have a diff different visual appearance. So here's an example. This is the market application. Uh, and if you look at the green headers in, in the middle of the list view, uh, those are disabled items. Uh, so they make them disable because they serve as headers, so they just indicate different sections of the list, and obviously it wouldn't make sense to be able to select them with the trackball or to click on them. Um, so it's a very simple feature that's used uh, heavily inside the Android uh, platform, and you can make great use of it inside your own applications. So sometimes just getting a click event on a specific list item isn't enough. You want the user to be able to make choices within that list. You may want that choice to be mutually exclusive. You can only select one item at a time. You may want the user to be able to select multiple items out of a specific list. So for that, we provide choice mode. You have single choice mode, which gives you radio buttons, once again, for mutually exclusive choices. And you have multiple choice mode, which lets you check a number of items within the list. So what happens when you want to get that checked state back out and read it in another part of your application? You can call several methods on list view. Get checked item position will return the, or the position of the item that you've selected in single choice mode. If you're in multiple choice mode, you can call get checked item positions, plural, and that'll give you the, all the positions that are currently checked. But we mentioned before that there's this concept of stable IDs within an adapter, where each value within the adapter has an integer that specifies uniquely that value, no matter how the position may change due to other deletions or insertions. So if you're going to have a lot of deletions and insertions within your adapter over time, and you're also making choices, then you can use get checked item IDs to refer to those items by ID so that the positions don't get out of alignment with your actual data. Come on. There we go. So here's an example of each one of the choice modes. Um, you've probably seen these before in the ringtone selector and in the selector for which uh, labels you want to display in Gmail. So this is how it looks by default, but as always, you're in control of the presentation through get view, so you can make these look as fancy as you like. Now, uh, something that's very subtle about Lizu is how we handle focusable items. Uh, one of the big constraints that we have on the UI toolkit team is that we need to support trackballs and touch screens. Uh, and we decided early on that as soon as you touch the screen, the focus or the selection goes away. And that's why we have the choice mode, for instance. You can't just let the user tap an item uh, in a list and keep the selection on screen. Lizu like, will fight really hard to make that not happen. Um, so 
Something we've done is that by default, if you put a focusable item inside the list view item, so in, for instance, if you have a row in your list that contains a couple of buttons, by default, the entire row will be selected when you use the trackball. And the reason for that is that it would be very awkward to have trackball navigation that would go from selecting the whole item to selecting little items inside the, 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 the row itself. So if you want more control over that, if you want to have selectable, uh, focusable items inside the row, you can tell, you can tell LizView that you want that to happen. So if you call set items can focus and you pass true, you're telling LizView, okay, so now my rows, I don't want to select the entire rows, I want to select stuff inside the rows. Um, and we have an example here. So on the left side, we have the contact application. Uh, you can see that there's a focusable item uh, on the left that's the, uh, that's the quick contact action. Um, but by default, they decided that they didn't want the user to be able to select that with the trackball. So when you use the trackball, you can only select the entire row, the entire contact. On the other hand, in the Twitter application, they use that feature to be able to, uh, to let you select the links inside each tweet. So you won't be able to select the entire tweet, but you can uh, navigate with the trackball from link to link. Uh, so we realize that it's a bit awkward and sometimes it's difficult when you, uh, when you want to have complex list items that have several touchable areas. There are various ways to handle that. There are like great tutorials and explanations on various mailing lists and forums on the web. Uh, and this is something we would like to improve in the future. Uh, so if you have ideas on how we should do that, uh, feel free to contact us on the various Android groups and we can talk about it. Uh, my current idea is to maybe have a, a, a list view too uh, that will support only touch mode uh, and will be closer to what you see on other platforms. So it's pretty rare that you have a list that you just want to show without context. Generally, you want to say something to the user about what this list contains and what they're supposed to do with it. So for this, again, we come back to the Twitter application that was recently released. As you can see here, we've got several different items that provide context for what it is you're looking at. We have the tweets header up top. We say that we're looking at uh, tweets by Google I.O. in this case. But also at the bottom, we have this extra element that specifies that we're at the end of the list and that we're loading new content on demand. So this is an example of several different uh, ways of handling headers and footers within a list view. If you want to use a fixed header, well, this is pretty easy. All you need to do is place other views either above or below your list view. And you've probably seen layouts quite a bit like this before. If you want them to scroll, then things get a little bit more complex. But we've done a little bit of the work for you so that you don't have to worry too much about it. Add header view and add footer view both let you specify a view that will appear at the very beginning and the very end of all the other list content in your adapter. You can put whatever you want in here. However, the trick to this is that you have to call these functions before set adapter. And that might give you a little bit of a clue as to how this is implemented under the hood. Both these functions also take an extra parameter, is selectable. This corresponds to whether or not the final adapter being used will report back to the list that these items are enabled. There's a little bit of a naming conflict about that. Sorry about it. It's not the most intuitive thing in the world. So as you might have guessed, ListView does this by internally wrapping your adapter inside another one, and it returns different view types for the first and last item. So what you need to be careful of with this is that you don't make assumptions that if you do get adapter on your list, that it's going to be the same object instance that you passed in to set adapter in the first place. And we're going to take a look at the list selectors real quick. So the list selector is what you see when you use the trackball to navigate around. This is also what you see when you perform a long click on an item or when you simply tap the item. When you tap an item, you, can, you will see the selector appear on screen briefly for like 150 milliseconds or something like that. Uh, you can customize the list selector, but what's really important to, to realize that, first of all, the list selector is not shown in touch mode. Um, so if you select an item with a trackball, then you touch the screen, like we, I mentioned before, uh, the selection disappears. Um, and also, the selector by default is shown behind the items. So this can be a problem if your items have custom backgrounds. So if you have a texture or custom color, sorry, or custom color, then you won't see, you, you won't be able to see your selector. So on the list view, um, in XML, there's also an equivalent Java API. You can use the attribute called draw selector on top, and if you specify it to true, then we're going to put the selector on top. If you do that with a default selector, then you won't be able to see your item because our default selector is totally opaque. Um, 
and that won't work really well. So here we have the, an example of an application on the market called Color Notes. As you can see, their items have a, a custom background color, so the items have a yellow background, and they've created their own selector. So they've created a, a simple uh, orange border, and how they've done that was simply to set the uh, draw selector on top equals true uh, attribute on list view, so that we move the selector back on top of the item. Uh, now, if you wanted to have a selector that was uh, filled, because you can see here that it's hollow, so if you still want the orange highlight, but you also wanted to have a custom background color, you need, uh, you need to do a little more work, and we'll see how to do that in a couple of slides. Um, this is the kind of XML that you have to write to create a list selector. So how many of you have ever created their own custom selector? Uh, quite a few, and I'm sure that uh, you were a bit uh, puzzled at first on how to make it work. Uh, basically, the idea is that you create a drawable that would tell the framework uh, what drawable to use based on the, the current state of the item. So we have a bunch of different states. We have whether or not the window has the focus, whether or not the widget is focused, whether or not the widget is pressed or selected, etc. Uh, as, as you can see here, uh, usually you have to be extremely precise about the states. So if you look at line number six, we're saying, okay, if the item is focused and is not enabled, and is pressed, then we're gonna use the drawable in a list selector background disabled. Uh, so the best you can do is not to write those from scratch, just uh, grab the source code of the Android platform, or I think we have some examples in the API demos, um, and just copy and paste what we have and just replace uh, everything with your own drawables. Uh, there's also one little trick here. If you look at line number 13, for instance, uh, we, are, we are referring a, a drawable cause, called list selector background transition. Uh, that's the drawable that animates when you long click on an item in a list. It turns from orange to white. And if you're interested in how to make that happen, uh, you can just go check out our source code and you will see how to declare that kind of animation in XML. It's actually pretty simple. Um, now, if you have the, if your, if your items in the list have a custom background, uh, a custom opaque background like we just saw on the screenshot, and you still want to have an opaque selector that's drawn behind the item, there's a very simple trick you can use. You can use a selector drawable for your item's background. And all you have to do is give it a transparent background when it's selected. So here you can see it's only a few lines of XML, and you can see that for the, the state selected equals, for the selected state, uh, we use the transparent color which is the, just the number zero. And in every other case, we just use uh, whatever color we decide to use for our, for, our, for our item. So this is a very simple trick, but it lets you customize your list view in a, in, in a whole new ways. So coming into a few of the other features of list view, as any of you who have worked with list view so far will probably already know, there's a whole other grab bag of functionality that's available for you to use. So we're gonna go through a couple of those really quickly. So transcript mode. How many of you have tried to write anything resembling like some sort of chat client? Anyone? Okay, we have a few. So hopefully you've found transcript mode useful. So this changes the behavior of the list when the content changes. So when you call notify data set changed, your list performs another layout pass. This defines where we're going to scroll to now that you have new content. If it's disabled, which is our default, then we don't scroll when anything changes in terms of your adapter contents. If you set transcript mode to normal, however, then if you're at the edge of the list and new content comes in, then we're gonna go ahead and scroll to the bottom if the last item is visible. So this basically makes it such that if you're in the middle of a chat client and you're scrolling back in history and a new message comes in, you're not gonna scroll to the bottom immediately there. But if you're already at the bottom and sort of paying attention to the live stream of things coming in, then we are gonna go ahead and scroll down and make that last item visible for you. So if you're doing a chat client, usually you're also, um, you don't want everything just stacking from the top. That's not usually the way that you view a chat client. So we have stack from bottom that makes all of the elements you know, as described, stack up from the bottom in terms of like a chat history to sort of match up with any sort of input field that you may have below it. So we stack items in reverse order and we start with the last item from the adapter. So your order still stays the same, but we just sort of traverse it differently. Once again, this comes down to uh, don't make assumptions about the order of calls to get view. So again, this is really useful for any sort of chat client that you might be trying to create. Here's an example of it. You've probably seen something very similar before. 
This is using both transcript mode and stack from bottom. As you can see, we're building the list from the bottom so we have the empty space at the top rather than down below. Every list supports a feature called text filtering. Uh, this is a feature that was extremely useful uh, on the first device, on the first Android device that came out, the T-Mobile G1, because it had a keyboard. And if you have a Droid, you can actually use that feature pretty easily. Uh, on other devices, you have to bring the soft keyboard by keeping the menu key pressed uh, to be able to use it. So what it does is it lets you, here's a screenshot. So for instance, at the music application, if you bring up the keyboard, um, and you start typing, you're gonna filter the content of the list. So we're gonna show you only the items that match whatever you typed. And the matching rules depend entirely on your adapter. We have some adapters that by default implement uh, the filter. So for instance, cursor adapter and array adapter uh, have a basic implementation of, of the filter. Um, I think in array adapter, we just uh, do a, an, an equality comparison. So if whatever you type equals what the item contains, then we're gonna show it, otherwise it's gonna be removed from the list. Um, it's very simple to, uh, to implement yourself if you have a custom adapter. All you have to do is implement the filterable interface and then implement the getFilter method. From the getFilter method, you have to return a new instance of, a, of the filter class. And the filter class has only two methods. Uh, so what's nice about the filtering uh, mechanism in Android is that we do all the hard work for you. So we handle uh, everything on a background thread. Uh, so we'll, we're gonna invoke, when users start typing, we're gonna invoke this method called perform filtering on the background thread. So you can do whatever you want in there. It can be very expensive, it doesn't matter, because you're not going to block the UI. Uh, so we're gonna pass you as a char sequence whatever the user has typed, and then it's up to you to rebuild a new list of data that you want to display in the list view. And to uh, display that new, that new set of data, you have to return a set of filter results. So the filter resu result is a simple class that contains the number of items that you want to show after filtering, and um, uh, an object. So the object is whatever you want. Uh, it's only used to be able, it can be a cursor, it can be an array, it can be whatever you need. So then when you return that filter result, uh, we're gonna invoke the publish results method on the UI thread, and we're gonna give you back that filter result object. And your job in this method is simply to extract the data that you put in the filter result and, uh, and communicate it to your adapter. So this is where you modify the adapter, and it's also, also where you uh, call notify that asset changed. Uh, implementing a filter is pretty simple. It involves a couple of classes, but again, if you look at the Android source code and you go to the source code of the array adapter or the cursor adapter, you'll see how how we've done it, and it's extremely simple. Uh, something that's interesting here, for instance, if the number of results is zero, you might want to call notify data set invalidated uh, to tell you that there's no more data to display. So now we're gonna, we, we want to talk about a few issues that you might encounter with ListView. How many of you have ever seen that? Like you have a beautiful ListView, you have a custom background, and you start scrolling and everything is black. Okay, so a few already. So the other ones have probably not tried to uh, customize the background of the list view. Uh, the reason for that is simply because of an optimization that we've done very early in list view. Um, so the, the, the problem we have with list view, uh, especially on low-end devices like the T-Mobile G1 or even uh, slower devices is that when you scroll through uh, a, a lot of items, especially when you, you're flinging and you see like dozens and dozens of, of items go by every second, we do a lot of, of blending on screen. And blending is a very expensive operation. That's because list items by default are transparent. So to avoid that, what we do is that we're trying to figure out what is the color behind the list. And by default, we know what that color is. It's some kind of black. So we, we turn every item into a bitmap and we fill that, the background of that bitmap with the, the color that's behind the list. So once we've done that, we know that the entire list is going to be opaque, so we can do optimizations like not draw the window that's behind the list and avoid the blending code path in our uh, 2D library, which happened to be slower than the non-blending code path. Um, and actually, that, that, that optimization happens as soon as you touch the screen. As soon as your finger uh, comes into contact with the screen, we turn all the items on screen into bitmaps. Uh, so the solution to that issue is simply to specify the cache color hint. This is an indication for this view uh, about the background color. So if you specify the color zero, like in the first line of the solution here, you're telling this view, okay, I don't have a solid background. I may have a texture or I have a complex background. Like, please don't do any optimization. So then we're gonna go through a slower code path, but at least you will be able to see uh, everything. And if you remember one of the first slides when I showed you uh, this app I wrote that had a wooden texture, this is what I've done. I disabled the cache color hint. 
Now, if you have a background color, uh, a solid background color, that, and you know what is that background color, for instance, you're writing an application that's green in the background, uh, you can simply specify that, that color, and then you're gonna get the optimization of this view, and you're gonna get the correct result. So how many of you have been flinging through a list before and seen that the scroll bar along the side of the screen changes size? Yes, okay. This Bunch is what we call the snake. Right, the snake effect. So the reason why this happens is, again, because we're only drawing as many views as we need on screen. And when views have vastly differing heights, being able to measure that such that we can estimate how much more space is left to scroll through across the rest of the adapter becomes a really difficult problem. It's the sort of thing that we have to get some sort of approximation fast. And that's why you end up seeing the scroll bar changing size. So if you don't like this effect, if this is something that really sort of detracts from your app, then you can go ahead and set uh, smooth scroll bar equals false on your list. What this will do is it tells ListView, don't even try to bother measuring heights of items to give an estimate of how much scroll space is left. Instead, just use your current position in terms of what items are on screen. This will make it a little bit chunkier if you have uh, smaller data sets, but across very large data sets, this will really smooth out how the list looks in terms of its scroll bars. Another solution is also to just remove the scroll bar. <laughs> Uh, okay, so this is something I've seen way too many times, and every time I see it, I start swearing in front of my, of my screen, and then Joe hates me because he sits next to me. Uh, this is when you set the layout height of a view in XML to wrap content. So have you ever done that? That's okay, I won't be mad at you. Like, just raise your hands. Okay. I like when people admit their errors. Um, the problem with wrap content is that Lizu is virtualized. Uh, so at least you can have two items, but it can have millions of items. So when you tell us wrap content, it means, okay, I want the list view to be, to be as big as its content. Should we go through the million items and measure them? That would probably not be a very good idea. Um, and because so many people are requesting that or are trying to do it, we made it work without making it work. So if you set the, the height of your list view to wrap content, we're gonna measure the first three items of your list. Uh, and actually, a lot of people are confused by that behavior because sometimes I see messages on our groups uh, saying, hey, you know, when I, when I put log statements in my get you method, I see that the list is requesting items number 0, 1, 2, and then 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 again. And they don't, get, they don't understand why, and that's the reason. Because during the layout, we're gonna uh, ask the adapter for the first three items, we're gonna measure them, put them in the recycler, and then when we need the real items, we're gonna ask for these items again. Um, it is expensive, uh, especially if you have very complex items in your list view. If you're crazy and you put web views inside your list, then uh, it's gonna take a lot of time for the list view to measure itself. Uh, and most of the time, that's really not what you want. Um, so just avoid it. Uh, either use field parent as the height of your list view, or if you're in a linear layout, you can set the height to zero, and then you can use the layout weight uh, to tell the list to, to fill the uh, remaining available space. Uh, you can also set the height of your list view to a fixed amount. Like you can set 200 DIPs uh, to use 200 pixels on the G1. So how many people have wanted to do this before? A list view inside of a scroll view. Once again, don't be shy. Come on, hands up. Okay. So what happens here? A scroll view scrolls, a list view scrolls. Which one should scroll when you start moving? We actually got a moderator question for this over the weekend for this session already, um, asking if we could add an element, uh, or an attribute rather, to list view to say, you know, can I make my list view scrollable equals false so that I can put it inside a scroll view and just let the scroll view take care of it? Well, the quick answer to that is no. And the reason for that is that, once again, a list view can have tens of thousands, possibly even millions of items inside of it. And the correct answer in that case is almost never to open up that many views, throw them all into a scroll view, and just sort of let the system you know, die trying to chug along processing all of that. So generally, this is where you know, any engineer asks the question, okay, what is it that you're trying to do? And generally the answer to that is, well, I wanna have something special either above or below my list, but I wanna have mostly just my list content through this view. So 
for that, we would really like to point you towards the existing header and footer features that already exist. If you have a layout that you want to put above or below a list and still have the entire thing scroll, you can go ahead and set that as a list header or footer. Oh, and by the way, when we tell you to not put a list view inside the scroll view, don't put a scroll view inside the list view. That's equal Yeah, wrong. that too. Uh, yeah, so we mentioned that before uh, in the talk at the beginning, but we really want to insist on that point. Like, do not try to cache views inside your adapter. I've seen that done way too many times. Uh, there are various reasons why people try to do it. Uh, and th the problem is that it, will, it might work, and most of the time your list might work, and then suddenly someday, like, something really weird is going to start happening. Like, maybe you won't be able to click the item, maybe uh, you have an animation that that item that doesn't work anymore. And the reason for that is that, again, Lizu has many optimizations. It has a very complex recycler. Uh, it makes a lot of assumptions about uh, the ownership of the views uh, that are on screen. And to make things even faster, when Lizu puts something in the recycler, that view is not really off screen. Like, the view still thinks that it's kind of on screen, but the Lizu knows that it's not really the case. Um, so it's, we handle that very, very carefully, and again, for performance reasons. And as soon as you, 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 you know, try to play tricks in your adapter, we're going to end up with views that are basically zombie views. Uh, for instance, if from the getView method you return a view that we also have in our recycler, uh, we're going to have a view that's supposed to be on screen, but at the same time, that's not on screen. Um, so then the framework just, get, you know, just gives up and says, hey, whatever, like, I give up. Um, so just never, ever, 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 ever do that. Um, if you need to access a view directly, we have a method called guest, uh, get first visible position. Uh, it, it tells you uh, what is the position in your adapter of the first view that's visible on screen. So by using uh, this, this method and get child count that tells you how many items are visible on screen, you can easily go back and forth between the index and the positions. So if you want to, uh, for some reason, like change the color of a, of a view on screen without doing a notified data set change, uh, just use get child at on the list view to, to get the view that you need. So finally, after all of this, I'm sure that we've uh, sort of hammered home the point. List view is a really complex widget. It's probably the most complex one that we have across the entire Android framework. We spend a lot of time in there just not only helping developers, but just making sure that everything stays working, fast, optimized, and really, it's optimized for repeating unbounded data. It adds a lot of complexity to your app. So if you have a small amount of data that you just want to have some sort of repeating presentation for, maybe you don't actually need a list view for it at all. Maybe all you need in this case is to dynamically generate some views, put them inside a linear layout with a vertical orientation, and put that layout inside a scroll view. And this is going to make your app a lot simpler if you have a small data set with a bunch of special cases inside it, rather than trying to sort of bend list view into whatever application you have for it. And that's pretty much it for today. We could go on for hours about list view because there are many features we haven't talked about. There are many kind of stuff that you should know about. Uh, but I'm sure by now you're all pretty bored about list view. So we're going to uh, start taking questions. If you want to ask your questions, you can go to the mics in the alleys. Uh, and we also have questions maybe on moderator. Oh, do we want to bring that up? Don't be shy. You can come ask questions. We're right here. You can ask about anything you want that's related to Android. Hi. Um, you said not to put list views in scroll views, um, but the assumption behind that was that the scroll view uh, be vertically scrolling. If we want to emulate something like the Palm Pre's pager, where we have vertical scrolling and then horizontal paging, um, I've seen on forums and stuff that some people are trying to do that, and that's also been done with the Google Sports application. Mm -hmm. But there's been that particular app, I, as far as I can tell, so far is closed source, but we'd like to know how to do that. Well, so basically, so you, you have a vertically scrolling list view, and you want to go from page to page horizontally, right? I have many list views of similar yeah. but different but, content. So I'm that is fine. Like, you can use a horizontal scroll view. Um, what matters is that the, the, the two scrolls that you have are not on the same axis. Yeah. Uh, the home screen, for instance, has a pager, and we could put, when you open the folder on home, it's a list. And you can still page horizontally and, and scroll that list. Uh, 
you can look at the source code of the launcher application. Uh, it's called workspace.java. It's called workspace.java. And I think we have that in other applications somewhere else. Uh, but you know, look at workspace.java in the launcher source code, and you'll see it's pretty easy to do. Sure. Yeah, we've had a number of discussions about specifically adding a widget capable of doing this sort of horizontal paging into the framework. And so far, we haven't decided on the best way to do it, just in terms of getting it out there, making sure that people are able to make good use of it. Thanks. So, uh, excuse me. Uh, I have a view in my app that is, I try to have, be inspired right from the market app. The way that for an individual app, it, it has some headers and, and some little lists inside it, and a lot. I thought that was really great. Um, and implementing that myself, uh, without like looking how the market source code did it, was really tricky. And it's a little too complicated for me to want to do the sort of linear layout scroll view. Uh, it's, it, it feels like a list view, but in order to to do that, I mean, I. I ended up having to do a lot of Java code, like pull up, instead of one larger XML file, it's a lot of small ones that get bound together through Java work. Uh, I ended up using a, a merge adapter, sort of a general thing that Mark Murphy made, which is really helpful for that, that purpose. Um, so it's just unifying a lot of different adapters together. It just feels like overkill. Is there, am I missing something and how to do that? No, that's pretty much the way to do it. I mean, th the big problem again is that Lizu was mostly designed to have a long list of data and you know, every item is pretty much the same. Uh, we do support very different items like, like you mentioned, but yeah, when you want to do that, unfortunately, you ha you'll have some work to do. Uh, right, and the merge adapter itself is really non-trivial in how it has to track uh, what the position of every item and, and show the right one. It's just something I would never want to do myself, but I guess that's just the way it is. Yeah, Okay. sorry. But again, if you have you know if you have suggestions, like I'm sure there are you know solutions that we haven't thought of, like contact us and we can or file bugs. We we do look at them, um, and uh, and we'll, we'll see what we can do in a future release. Um, I'm going to take one of the Dory questions. Uh, so someone, Larry from China, asks: Long click to get more actions for an item is very wired for a normal user. Can we have similar UI widget like contacts action menu, just like Twitter developed by themselves? So I think he's referring to that little pop-up you get when you, when you click on a contact in the address book since uh, Android 2.0. Uh, and the answer to that is uh, yes, sure. You can have one. Uh, we, the, the Twitter app is going to be open source, so you know, you're going to have the, the, the source code for that widget, so you'll be able to use it. And it's actually pretty easy to do. Uh, maybe it's easy for me to say that because I know how it's done, but uh, once you'll see the source code, you'll see there's no, there's no magic in there. Yes, thanks. Any tips on um, how to do an adapter review where um, the length of the data set is not known? For me? So it's potentially an infinite. The, the length of the data set is not known. Uh, yeah, actually, that's what the calendar does. Uh, the calendar, when you, I think when you go into the agenda mode, uh, they have basically an infinite list. Uh, and they do that by just uh, playing with the notified data set changed. Um, so they just, said that they have you know, integer dot max, uh, max value number of items, and then they just populate with more stuff. Every time you can notify this a change, you can change the number of items in, in, the, in, in the adapter. So you can just grab you know, a random number, and then later on, if you, know, if you realize that you have more items, you can change that number and, and keep going. Okay, thank you. I noticed when I used uh, bitmaps to load, so like thumbnails also, um, that the whole views uh, have to be refreshed. Is there any method like to say only one item and um, one specific item by ID is going to be changed? Or yeah, actually, so if you're trying to change, so if you're trying to change one item and you call notify that asset changed, uh, yeah, the whole view is going to be refreshed. But actually, uh, Lizu is pretty smart here, and that's where we have our complex recycler because it's able to figure out that most of what you're changing is actually the same as on screen, so it's going to reuse everything it can. Uh, it's still going to redraw the entire screen, uh, but if that's a real issue for you, uh, you can you know, directly grab the view. You can go call get, get child at, and that's why you use get first visible position to figure out what's the translation between the position and the index, and then you can just you know, call set image or whatever you want on, on the view. Um, if you want a good example, if you look at uh, code.google.com slash p slash shelves, uh, that's the application I showed in, in one of the first slides. Uh, I have very complex code to support that kind of optimized code, and you can you optimize the operation, and you can look at it and, and see how to do it. Uh, over there. Hi, um, I have two questions. Uh, first is we, tr we try to use a relative layout for a row in the list, and it seems to uh, ignore the attributes in the relative layout. Aha, um, I know why. <laughs> <laughs> 
And actually, I put the answer on one of the slides. Um, yeah, so the problem is that you have a relative layout and your layout attributes are ignored, right? And it's actually something very simple and that's the documentation for that sucks. And again, that's totally our fault, so I'm very sorry. Uh, <laughs> let's see. So here, for instance, uh, we're calling inflate and we're passing null as the last parameter. Null is the parent, uh, so th that parameter is the parent of the view you're inflating. By saying null, you're telling the framework, well, I don't know what the parent's gonna be. And when we don't know the parent, we don't know what the layout parameters will be, so we just give up and we just don't get the parameters. So what you have to do is call this version of inflate, where you pass the parent, and that's why in get view we give you the parent. So you pass the parent, but if you pass true at the end, we're gonna call add view on the parent with the view you're inflating. But if you do that on the list view, it's gonna crash. So you have to pass <laughs> false. So whenever you're in get view and you inflate something, always pass the parent and false uh, in the inflate call. And that will work. Okay, thank you. Uh, second question. We also use, we try to use the alpha indexer for fast scrolling. And if the data does change, it seems like the alpha indexer can't be updated. Yes, that's a current limitation. Uh, we have a bug file somewhere internally about that. Uh, maybe we will do it, but I don't think it's gonna happen anytime soon. So if you guys want to write a cool patch, uh, I'm gonna review it myself, uh, and I'll be very glad to accept it. Okay, thank you. You said you're taking questions about Android in general? We can try. Okay, well, I'm playing catch up because the family emergency kept me out yesterday. Has Froyo been addressed or is there a word when it will be? Nothing is has it, been announced. Okay. Is it, is it true that it has hit AOSP already, though? Nothing has been announced. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we are very, very good at dodging those questions, so don't even try. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, the mic first. Can you go ahead, the mic? Yes, so the yes, slides, every session uh, within the next few weeks will be available on the Google I.O. website. You'll get the video and the slides. I don't know. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, so I have a list view um, that part of my apps, it, part of my app is a, um, it's a surveying app, so I'm using uh, GPS between two uh, devices. It's a, Long story is it takes exactly what it does and what I'm doing that for. I'll just get right to the point with the list view question. Um, so one of the things is it, um, part of this is it, um, I'm using SMS to send messages back and forth. So you can either send, somebody can send you their current position, their current GPS coordinates, or they can send you a message that says like, could you move like, you know, 10 yards to the right or something like that. So right now I'm using a, a Java regex to sort out between when somebody says you a pair of GPS coordinates and populating that in the list view that has your, the positional data versus this little chat window that I, this little, this little chat window which has the list view. Um, you were talking earlier about a, um, a class which uh, will do sort of like predictive, um, some sort of sorting out of, you know, oh, as you're filtering. typing or as the data oh, yeah, comes the, in? Uh, yeah, it's uh, filtering. So if yeah. you... So I'm wondering, is, is, would the filter be more appropriate with that or am I just better off, is, is the regex gonna be faster? Uh, I mean, you can implement the filter with the regex, so I mean, it's really up to you. Okay. I, I don't think it matters in your case. Okay, so it's not, I'm not getting, losing or gaining anything no, just no, by no, going no, to java.regex. Okay. Not at all. Okay, all right, uh, thanks. Is, so is, the, is the filtering, is that mostly for interactive? Is that meant mostly for interactive? Uh, yes, it's mostly yes. for interactive. Okay. You, can right, use so it, you can use it for non-interactive actions, but it's not really meant for that. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, so question from Dory. Uh, so setting the adapter to the list view can become a blocking operation if the adapter gets the data from the network. Any tips? Use threads. <laughs> That's pretty much all there is to it. Just so, don't block the UI thread. <laughs> right, again, the trick here is to make sure that even if you're collecting your data from the network, you have to perform the commit operation on the UI thread. So you can go ahead and just post a message to your UI thread through the normal event system and take your big blob of data that you have at the end and go ahead and commit those changes to the adapter there and call notify data set changed. Hi, uh, I, uh, I have a list that I set the list adapter from array that I have in my program and on click, you know, most of the time it works just great. I have the position and then you guys were talking about the filter and then there's an ID. I'm wondering, can I use that ID and will it correlate to my array in the, the position it should be? Because the position, you know, if there are filters and then there's three items, 100 items in the array, then it picks the wrong items. So 
Yeah, Can I guarantee that they'll correlate? So, so by default, the, in an array adapter, the ID is the index of the item inside the array. Okay. Uh, so it's gonna so when you filter the array adapter, the IDs will change, so they're not stable. Uh, so if you want them to be stable across filtering, you will have to implement your own adapter and maybe change the filter to store some extra data in the item so that you, you can know what item it is. Okay, okay. So I just basically have to cross-reference the data and just check. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we know it's not great, but sorry. And uh, unfortunately, we're out of time for the questions. So if you have more questions, we have the Android Google Groups, uh, there's Stack Overflow where you can ask questions online. Like a few of us are monitoring everything and we'll try to answer your questions when we have time. Thank you very much.